Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our Sunday worship gathering. Wherever you're listening from today, whatever you're going through, however you ended up hearing us, uh, if you're a member of our community that just has not been able to make it out either today or for a while, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Sorry we can't have a lot of back and forth, but um, our open prayer each Sunday is that uh, we would help people uh, find what matters most. And, and we believe that Jesus, knowing him, his love and grace, his compassion, his goodness, his love, his care is, is, is what matters most. And that when we come to know him and believe in him and trust him, that he makes us new creations. We're actually gonna talk today about uh, this creation again. We talked about it last week. How do Christians relate to this world God's given us? Um, but first and foremost, uh, this morning, I want you to know that when, when you surrender your life to Jesus, when you commit to him, when you uh, believe in him and trust him and recognize what he's done for you on the cross, um, you actually become a new creation. Uh, and his Holy Spirit actually uh, makes you new and, and helps you live in a way that you can love God, love others, and as we're gonna see today, can actually empower you to, to love this whole creation. Um, I, I hope today that you get a bigger picture of the glory and power and goodness of God. And we like to begin each Sunday by worshiping God through songs. So uh, wherever you are, I invite you to sing along. Um, we're gonna spend some time worshiping him in song and then there'll be a, a message from me on creation and new creation and our role in all of that. pursues me with his love and haunts me with each hearing of his softly spoken words my conscience a reminder of forgiveness that I need who is this king of glory who offers it to me of peace revealing things of heaven and all its mysteries my spirit's ever longing for his grace in which to stand who is this king of glory son of God and son of man Precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty, Almighty, the King of my King heart, of my the heart, King of glory, King of glory. Who is this King of glory? With strength and majesty, and wisdom beyond measure. Yeah, gracious King of kings. The creator of all things He is the king of glory And he's everything to me
precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty, Almighty, the King of my heart, heart, the King of glory, glory. his name is Jesus, precious Jesus, the Lord Almighty.
who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty, so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder, who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You laid down your life I would be set free Oh Jesus I sing for All that you've done for King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, this is unfailing love, that you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh Jesus I sing for All that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain Worthy is the King who conquered the grave Our first scripture reading comes from Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the, the birds of the air and over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created a man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the earth. And our second reading is from chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. We're in the midst of a series called Co-Mission. And we're talking about participating in the life and mission of God. And that's a big, big topic, right? The Christian community, we're, we're to have communion with God, and we talked about that at the beginning of the year. 
And we're called to have community with one another. We're made to cultivate a relationship with God. And we're made to cultivate relationships where we love one another in the Christian community and love our neighbor as ourselves. So communion with God, relationship with each other, and God calls his followers and Jesus calls his followers to join in the mission of God in this world. So we're commissioned with God to do some things. God has a purpose and mission for the world he created, and he invites all of us to be part of it. Two weeks back, we said that Christ followers must know the big story of God in, in, as taught in the scriptures to participate in God's mission. And last week, we began talking about creation and new creation. And this, this week's going to be part two of that. Uh, we began last week by saying uh, that issues about creation, the environment, the decay of creation, they're everywhere. I, I spoke about Al Gore and Greta Thornburg and the Green New Deal and Christian organizations coming together to talk about climate change and doing something about that. I shared that this was an issue of concern all over the place for, for 30, 40 years now. Um, plastic straws have been banned in some local parts of this, uh, some parts of this country. The local food town in Red Bank where we, where we gather for church no longer has plastic or paper bags. And this was a big concern when I was in school and it's still a, a big concern taught in schools for my children today. Just this week, I saw three stories about creation and climate change. All of the late night hosts are commi committing to doing special green shows next week. The UN Secretary General gave a big speech at the large UN gathering this week about climate change and the need to do something on a, on a global level. Uh, Jeff Bezos uh, donated one billion, billion with a B, dollars for environmental causes. This is everywhere. And there's political and national implications with all of these debates and decisions. But we set that aside and we said, how should Christians think about these things? What does this have to do with following Jesus? And, and what do we have to offer? What do followers of Jesus have to say about this? Well, first, we believe that God made this world and God cares a lot about creation. And God has a mission for creation. So if we're gonna be part of his mission, then we should care about creation as much as he does, right? We should care about the things God cares about. And if we're to join in his mission in this world, then we should work towards what his goal and mission is for his creation. So that's one reason we should care. And two, apart from all the noise and debates and media coverage, and there's a lot of good debates to have and it's complicated, but amidst all of that, the Christian community has something to say. And we have a way to live. We have something to offer, to share, to contribute in how we speak about these issues and how we live our lives related to these issues. We can say, hey, this is what Jesus followers believe on this issue. We can say this is what our, our scriptures, our holy scriptures say about creation. We have a sacred text that tells us to live this way in relation to the creation that we believe God made. So part of our witness to the world about who God is, is how we understand creation. So this is an important issue for followers of Jesus. And last week we looked at God and creation. We went through a lot of scriptures, like 10 to 12 of them, to see how God relates to creation and what the scriptures say about creation. And there's quite a bit. We only scratched the surface, but we looked at a lot of different selections from the Bible to paint a picture of what the Bible has to say about creation. And I'm gonna give you a few quotes, and these will be up on slides just to give you an overview of last week and kind of as recap. Uh, but the Bible begins and ends with creation. It opens with the words, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And its final great vision in Revelation opens with the or closes the book of Revelation with the words, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. That's from Christopher Wright. Another quote from Christopher Wright, who, who writes about this, uh, kind of explains all of last week. He says, the Bible's story is that the God who created the universe, only to see it ravaged by evil and sin, has committed himself to the total redemption and restoration of the whole creation. He has accomplished it in advance through the cross and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth, and will bring it to glorious completion in the new creation when Christ returns. And in between the great poles of the original creation and the new creation, the Bible has a great deal more to say about creation. That's from scholar uh, Christopher Wright. Uh, he hits a lot of the things we, we talked about last week. So that summarizes in, in a lot of theological language the big picture. Uh, we said that God made this whole creation and it was good, 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 very good. And we said that this creation points to the glory of God. 
And we said there's also this brokenness, this hurt, this harm, this curse done to all of creation. All of creation has been ravaged by sin and evil, as, as Wright says. Uh, humans, we've been ravaged by sin and evil, as has the ground and the animals and everything's broken. There's a curse. And the land, the creation's waiting to be renewed and transformed. We looked and said last week that creation's waiting for the revealing of the glory of the children of God. Creation's longing to be made new. It's longing for healing. And we looked at this passage in Colossians uh, where Paul, one of the, the author of Colossians, he wrote to this church in Colossae, he said, the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross reconciled all things, including creation. Jesus, as Wright says, to quote him again, has committed himself to the total redemption and restoration of the whole creation. And he's accomplished it in advance through the cross and resurrection. And he's going to bring it to glorious completion in the new creation when he returns. And now we live in between this great pole of original creation and the fall and the new creation breaking in. And that's the big sweeping story on creation. And you can go listen to last week's message to get a better understanding of that. Uh, we spent some time unpacking that and there's lots more, but you can look at that as a starting point. So, if we are Jesus followers, what is our mission in relation to this creation? That's what we're going to look at today. What mission does God give us? T to see what our mission is, I want to start by having us look at uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. In Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he says this. He says, if anyone's in Christ, there is a new creation. God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. And he says, in Christ, God was reconciling the world or the, the cosmos, which is the sum total of everything in the universe to himself. And now we're called to be ambassadors for him. So the way we understand ourselves as Christians is we are ambassadors for Jesus, ministers of his reconciliation for the whole cosmos. We have an ambassadorship or a role to play in reconciling the cosmos. And this is a bit confusing, but just like Jesus reconciles us to himself on the cross, but we aren't fully changed till he returns, it seems like it's similar for all of creation. Jesus has accomplished the work on the cross to break in new creation. And we have the first fruits and the power of the spirit. And now we can start living towards this new creation. And, and we are the ambassadors for this new creation kingdom of Jesus. And now we're called to live towards that future kingdom in the present. We're ambassadors for another, another kingdom. And that's going to impact creation as, as, the cross has, as the cross has reconciled all of creation, all of the cosmos. But we haven't seen the full fruit of that, the full flowering of that. And we won't see the fullness of that till, all, till the new heavens and new earth and Christ's return. But now... In this moment, we as the first fruits, followers of Jesus with the power of the Holy Spirit, we have this mission to break forth new creation. And it, it, we break forth in how we glorify and live towards God. We, we bring that new creation world into, uh, into the here and now and how we love and care for our neighbor, how we witness to Jesus' ways, and in how we live out the mission towards creation, how we care for the creation God's given us. So we're going to go back to Genesis 1 and 2 today because in these two chapters, God gives humanity a, a commission for how to act towards creation. And I believe uh, for followers of Jesus, for ambassadors of Jesus and his new creation, this charge is for us too. If you're in Jesus, you're a spirit-empowered first fruit of new creation. And by the power of Christ's sacrifice and the empowering of the Holy Spirit, you're called to live as a new creation. And that means you can love God. That means you can love your neighbor. And that means you can live out God's mission for creation. You can. We can. We won't be perfect by any means. But by the power of the Spirit and the work of Christ, we can move towards new creation life in, in all the ways we live. Now, I say this a lot. And... and but I want you to hear it again. You matter to God. Humans, you're an image bearer who God makes for glorious things. And so we're going to dive into these because in these verses we see how much we matter to God and how big his purpose is for all of us. And if you aren't a believer, aren't sure what you believe, then uh, listen to these verses because they make a claim on what God expects of all humans. Especially if you're a Jesus follower, if you're seeking to live in the power of his spirit, then we're called to live out his call for creation. 
And we're going to see what that call is in the opening verses of, of Genesis, uh, uh, the opening chapters of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2. So uh, we're going to be in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, and we're going to camp there for a while. So you can open it up and stay there, and I'll read it and then talk us through it. So Genesis 1, 26, after God's created all the other things, he says, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. Let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Verse 27, so God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. In 28, it says, God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So we're gonna unpack this a bit and we see uh, verse 26 is sort of shorthand for what's reinforced and elaborated on in verses 27 and 28. Uh, Hebrew writing, the sacred scriptures in the Bible, the first testament, they really love repetition. You repeat the important stuff. And this was originally orally translated, so you were saying it to other people, so repeating stuff's super important. So 26 starts with kind of the thoughts or pondering of God. God's kind of saying, well, we're going to make humans in our own image, and then we're going to commission them to rule this earth. And so we see right in 26 and 27 and 28, two key ideas for humans. They are one, image bearers, and they're called to rule. He says that in 26 and says it again in 27 and 28. And we're going to look at 27 now. It says, God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. The first thing we see, the text goes out of its way to state and to elaborate on is that we are image bearers. And this slowing down and stopping that male and female are image bearers, it stops the flow of the chapter. All the other creatures are made. And then God pauses and the text pauses and God's thinking, pondering and discussing and then creating in his image. Male and female in his image. We are image bearers. This is so important because this is so distinct from the beliefs in surrounding nations and it's distinct from our beliefs today. Uh, back then in Egypt and Mesopotamia, the kings can be made in the image of God. And Rome brought this back. They made Caesar a god after he died and then his children could be a son of God. His, his heir could be a son of God. But maybe the king was in the image of God, right? And he would put up his image all over the place in these ancient cultures. But most of the time, only other gods were made in the image of God. Quite often the humans in, in other religions of the time, Mesopotamia, Babylon, other places, the humans are slaves of the gods and made by the gods out of violent battles among the gods. But here in Genesis, male and female creatures are all image bearers. And it's marred after sin enters, but we're still image bearers. We are God's image bearers walking through all of creation. So it's not just the gods ruling or maybe the king as a god-like human. No, Adam, Eve, man, woman, the gardeners, you are my image-bearing rulers. Now rule in my ways. The verse continues and there's a blessing for them. And the blessing is like it says he blessed them. The blessing is like this special commissioning for a specific way to live out the role or their identity. Right, so there's a declaration of who they are, right? A declaration of who we are. You are image bearers, you're called to rule, but now I'm blessing you to go do it. So it's kind of the who, this is who you are, and the blessing is this is how you're gonna do it. You're the rulers, now I bless you to go do these things as my image bearing rulers. And this happens a lot in the Old Testament. Patriarchs bless their children and they get very specific. Here's how you shall act. Here's how you shall live when I'm gone. Here's what I'm entrusting you with. Here's your role and here's a blessing for you to live it out. So God blesses them and then he gives them these commissions. First, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. This first set of verbs, right? Be fruitful, multiply, fill. First thing we see is this blessing is a blessing for fertility. 
which if you can step into that world was absolutely one of the most important things to be able to, to procreate, to bring forth children in life. You see throughout the Old Testament narrative, all the way up to the birth of John the Baptist, there's struggle upon struggle upon struggle to be multiplying into having children. We see that even in the, in the sin in Genesis 3 that there's going to be pain in childbirth. A part of the created commission for image bearers is to commit to relationships together where they fill the earth with other image bearers. They are making children. They're filling the earth with the glory of God. And this actually gets fleshed out in Genesis 2 and Adam and Eve come together and bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh and what God has uh, brought together, let man not separate. And there's lots of other things to say about marriage and singleness and the church as married to Christ and having children and not having children. And in the New Testament, Paul's going to have some very interesting statements about remaining single uh, because of the time that we're in that's worth digging into. That's all beyond the scope of this message. That's another seven to 10 messages. You have to just wait on that for another time. But just to see here, this uh, initial commission involves God's people, God's image bearers being fruitful and multiplying. And after that, there's some more verbs that are really specific to humans. Some of that fruitful multiplying is specific to all the, or it's not specific, but it's for all the animals. But here there's more specific things for the humans. So be fruitful, multiply, fill, and then subdue and rule or have dominion. Subdue is this word kabas and dominion rada. These are strong words and they include this sense of imposing your will upon something. They're authoritative words. Now that does not mean they're words that allow humans to abuse the creation. It's not you're in charge, do whatever you want. The first word, uh, subduing, right? It, it has a focus on agriculture. Uh, but building up from that, we can take it to be this doing good organizing work throughout society, right? You're going to be plowing fields and organizing life. You're going to be making buildings and organizing towns and cities and societies. This subduing is hard, forceful work that cultivates and shapes creation for good. It's hard and it's posing, that's a fair word, but you do impose your will for the good of creation. You have to be organized. If you're a farmer or no farmers or have watched anything on farming, subdue is a fair word, right? It's a strong word, but not a violent word, right? Now, there are other hard jobs, uh, but the local farmer is hard work subduing, hard work subduing the land and all of that. Uh, Paul Harvey uh, has a famous kind of poem about farmers. It was uh, made into a Super Bowl ad, and you can watch it online. There's a million views, and it's the only time I've ever watched a Super Bowl ad and clapped. And it's called, On the Eighth Day, God Made a Farmer, I believe. Or it actually might just be called, In God Made a Farmer. But search it on YouTube, and you can watch it. First, he's wrong. God made the farmer already on the sixth day, not the eighth day. But here's some of the, the lyrics from his poem. So God made a farmer and God said, I need someone willing to get up before dawn, milk cows, work all day in the fields, milk cows again, eat supper, then go to town and stay past midnight at a meeting of the school board. So God made a farmer. God said, I need somebody with arms strong enough to rustle a calf and yet gentle enough to deliver his own grandchild. Somebody to call hogs, tame cantankerous machinery, so God made a farmer. God said it has to be somebody who'd plow deep and straight and not cut corners. Somebody to seed, weed, feed, breed, and rake, and disc, and plow, and plant, and tie the fleece, and strain the milk, and replenish the self-feeder. God said, I need somebody willing to sit up all night with a newborn cult and watch it die, then dry his eyes and say, maybe next year. So God made a farmer. This commission, subdue the earth. Here's this beautiful but difficult world for the good of society and the good of creation. And God declares, I formed a bunch of order from the chaos and now my image bearers, go be farmers, go subdue. Go be engineers, go be politicians, go be teachers, go be doctors, go be lawyers, go be soldiers, firefighters, police officers electricians, plumbers, builders, small business owners, butchers, bakers, candlestick makers. But go subdue. We all have a field to plow and to weed and to seed and to subdue. We all have our space in creation to bear God's image and do good, subduing, caring work for this creation. So subdue. 
subdue and then have dominion over or, or rule. The word uh, is rada. So we subdue and organize and care. There's this another strong authority word. It means to exercise authority that's been granted or acknowledged. In the scriptures, it's used to talk about priests having a, a role to rule, administrators, kings, tribal leaders, and shepherds. Followers of Jesus, we've been commissioned to rule. You've been granted authority to rule. Uh, God is passing to human hands a delegated form of his own authority over creation. Saying, here, rule over all the stuff of the earth. Here, be, my, be the kings here. Be the kings and queens to rule over this creation. Now we immediately hit a problem because if we're thinking how, well, how do kings and queens usually act? Most of them act terribly. And if we follow the stories of the kings and the nations of this world, we can easily twist this commission to our own ends, right? We see kings and leaders who protect their own power, destroy the land, imprison the people. Pharaoh enslaves the people and extrapolates as much as he can from the earth to build pyramids and building projects. The Roman Empire led the extinction of lots of animal and wildlife, particularly in North Africa, if I remember correctly. Um, most of Israel's kings, God's people who knew this commission, acted wickedly towards God. They worshiped other gods. They went to other gods for the fertility of the land. Uh, they neglected their fellow countrymen, the poor and the widow. They forgot the Sabbath rest and didn't care for the land. They got rich on the backs of others. And every one of us, who's a broken sinner, can fall prey to that same ruling power, right? It's easy to exploit and use our power for evil. And this is why it's so important when we think of what it means to rule, to look to the Jesus story and God as Father story. Because we look up and say, oh yeah, God tells us to rule, sounds good. Well, how do powerful people in our world rule? Let's go and do likewise. So then we end up slaughtering, abusing, neglecting, and saying, hey, God loves us and gave us a gift on this earth, and we're special, and God says, do what you want, you're in charge. And no, 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 no. That's what Israel's leaders do. They exploit, and they know the scriptures better than we ever will. If they lived like they did, and they lived like other kings, then we can fall prey to that abuse of power too. But God invites us to rule, but in his ways. I want you to see how God exercises his rule, his dominion, to help us see how we're called to do that as his image bears. In Psalm 145, it's this meditation on God reigning, and, and notice all the things it says about him. And this is verse eight. It says, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all. His compassion is over all that he made. You see that? He rules his compassion. He rules with compassion towards all the things. If we're commissioned to rule with compassion towards everything. In verse 10, it says, All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your faithful shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known to all people your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion, there's that word again, that rule word, endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in his words and gracious in all his deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. See that God's an open hand, right? Satisfying the desire of every living thing. The Lord is just in all of his ways and kind in all of his doing. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of all who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. You see the way that God rules? Compassion, an opening hand, an open hand, giving to all in due season, upholding, faithful, watching over, just, caring for all that fear him. 
The reign of God in creation is, is, is shaped by wisdom, power, goodness, grace, compassion, generosity, uh, protection, justice, and love. If that's what it means to rule, and that's how God rules, and the same quality should be seen in the way that we who are made in his image exercise the rule that God has entrusted to us. We are given the mission, the co-mission, the ambassadorship of ruling over creation but it has to be done in ways that are modeled on the character and values of God's own kingship. We are to be true God image bearing kings and queens, true kings and queens, not tyrants. When Paul is speaking to the Ephesians, the church in Ephesus, he says this, therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The way Paul puts it points us perfectly to Jesus because he's the perfect example of this. Uh, he's the perfect, fully what it means to be human in the image of God, right? Uh, what did he do on this earth? He was fruitful, he multiplied, he healed, he offered himself up as a sacrifice. He emptied himself, he came not to be served, but to serve. Jesus is this picture for us of how we should rule. And God puts him in charge, seats him at his right hand and puts him in charge over all creation, all things, heaven and earth and under the earth. So there's, there's two more verbs that I want to flesh out in this commission. In Genesis 2, the man's placed in the garden uh, by God to do two things. And this fleshes out a bit more what it means to subdue and rule. And it also points us to the ways of Jesus Christ, because this is how Jesus loves and cares for his creation too. So in 2.15, it says, The Lord took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to care for it. That first word work, it's abad. It means really to serve. It means to serve with the implications of doing hard work in the process of serving. And we see it translated work because it will be hard work, like subdue. But at its core, it's committed service. Uh, cultivate's another good word, right? It's hard to do really good work to cultivate something. You don't just do it once, you're with it, right? And the other word is samar, which is translated to take care of. It means to protect, to care for. It's the same word used when God confronts Cain about the death of Abel and he says, am I my brother's keeper? Saying, am I responsible to care for my brother? And God says, you know, the implication is yes, you should be doing that. It's the same word used when God tells Israel to remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. He's saying, care for it, cultivate it. God's saying, are you gonna care for my holiness? He tells the people. And then when he confronts Cain, he's like, are you gonna be your brother's keeper? Here he says, you're called to be keeping to caring for creation. Like you're called to care for my laws about keeping the Sabbath. Like you're called to glorify me by keeping my laws. The way you're called to, to live out my great mission for you uh, by loving your neighbor and keeping watch over your brother or sister. Here, go into this creation and keep it, care for it, serve it. I'll give you another quote from uh, Chris Wright who explains this well. He says, humans are servants of creation. And that's the way they exercise their kingship over it. Like Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And, and in that way, he became king, right? The verb samar, it's to keep something safe with protection, care, and watchfulness. It means to treat something or someone seriously as, as worthy of devoted attention. So all of these words, rule, serve, care for, keep, protect, defend. We all fail miserably at that, right? We fail to rule in the ways of God. We fail to worship and acknowledge God. We fail to love our neighbor and, and rule one another well with service and love and compassion. And we fail this commission to care for creation as well. It's why we need the blood of Jesus. The good news is we have the blood of Jesus on the cross. Let's go back to that, that first quote. I want you to see it again, because the Bible story is that God who created the universe, only to see it ravaged by sin and evil, has committed himself to the total redemption and restoration of the whole creation, and that includes us. And he's accomplished it through the cross and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And he's gonna bring it to glorious completion in the new creation when Christ returns. And in between, in between, we are commissioned to be ministers of reconciliation. 
we are commissioned to be ambassadors. If we believe and confess that Christ is our Lord and Savior and what he's done, then we're committing to be his ambassadors in all creation. We're committing to live in the new creation ways of subduing, ruling, serving, and keeping. This is what Jesus Christ has done for us and all of creation. He has served and given himself to keep us. If we put our faith in him and proclaim as Lord and Savior, then we walk in his new creation ways. We have in the power of our witness the opportunity to illuminate or obscure the glory of God and how we live out God's mission. If creation points to the glory of God, then our care, our serving, our keeping points our neighbor to the glory of God. When we faithfully live out this charge, when we keep, when we serve, when we subdue and rule for the good of others and the good of creation, we are ambassadors for Christ, pointing people to the kingdom of God and the great King, Jesus Christ. How do we do that? That's the, that's the bigger question, right? It feels overwhelming because it is overwhelming. And I recognize this is one of those things that's very tempting to say a few things. One, you can say, I haven't thought of it this way and I'm just going to ignore this. Um, if you feel that way, but also believe the Bible is the word of God, please, please, please read your Bible deeply and come up with a good reason as to why you don't believe this or don't agree with some of the things I've said in the last two sermons. Uh, but I, the second thing is, and I feel this definitely, maybe this is right, but it's just so impossible to figure out how to live this out. And I feel that 100%, right? Uh, but that can't be our attitude though. If this is what we're called to do, then we have to take steps in the right direction. If part of God's reconciliation includes creation and part of our mission is to care well for it, and if we believe in the work of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, then we have to believe, hope, and act in ways that move us towards new creation. And even if it's baby steps, it's still steps in the right direction. I'll leave it with you today. Think about it. Pray about it. Is this a, a commission for us that we have to take seriously? And what would it look like for a Christian community to take this commission seriously? What would happen if we did? I actually think it would be a compelling witness to many who aren't that interested in God, but who really love uh, this earth. Uh, for them to learn that there's a God who loves this earth too, and that there's people that, that live for God's glory by caring for the earth. Uh, I think we'd show more and more of God's glory to others. Um, and I think by ignoring this commission, we would ultimately obscure the glory of God and compromise our witness and keep people that might otherwise see just how good God is. But think about this, pray about this, consider what it, would it look like for followers of Jesus to, to take seriously uh, the commission in Genesis 1 and 2. What would it look like for us to live as new creations in Christ and how we care for creation? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you uh, that you uh, love us, love your whole creation, that you served all, emptied yourself completely, that you are the great victor who can conquer death and hell and evil. Lord, I thank you for your scriptures. I thank you for um, all of, the, uh, of your servants and followers who've kept these words, passed them down throughout the generations where we, we see you revealing yourself and your will for this world and um, Lord, show us what it means uh, to care for this creation as much as you do. Lord, show us how to follow you. Show us how to participate in your mission. Show us how to be your ambassadors, particularly in how it relates to this world that you've given us. This world that's hurting, this physical world, this creation that's hurting and yearning for, for new creation. Lord, I pray that everyone would see your glory, um, that followers of Jesus would live in ways that we point people to your glory, that people would see uh, how magnificent, how beauty, your justice, your love, your power, your goodness. Help us be image bearers that reflect that in how we live towards you, how we live towards others, and how we live towards uh, this creation that you have, have created and that you've fought to redeem and that one day you will tra transform completely. 
Lord, we pray all of these things in your name. Amen. Now the benediction. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ not counting man's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. 
We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And all God's people said, amen.